Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Darren. I'm head of clinical education and managing editor for orthopedics at the Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute, and I'll be moderating this ses session on orthobiologics in the elite athlete. Thank you so much for being here. We have people from all over the world joining us today, and it is a great pleasure to have Dr. Bert Mandelbaum with us. I'm going to make a quick introduction to him and then turn things over to his lecture. Dr. Bert Mandelbaum is one of the world's most foremost experts in the diagnosis and treatment of orthopedic conditions, especially of those related to the knee. He practices at Cedar sinai Curlin job Institute in Los Angeles, where he also serves as co-chair of medical affairs. His vast experience and skill are sought by some of the world's most prestigious athletic organizations. He serves as the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Major League Soccer, Medical Director for FIFA at the Medical Center of Excellence in Santa Monica, and is co-director for the U.S. Olympic Committee National Medical Network Advisory Group. He is a pioneer in many orthobiologic techniques and the co-founder and former co-chairman of the Biologic Association. Before we get started, please post any questions you have throughout the lecture in the Q&A section, and at the end, we will go through as many of those as we can. With that said, it is a great pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Bert Mandelbaum. Well, Greg, good evening, everybody. And really, it's a pleasure to have uh, this webinar this evening to talk about something that's really important to, to me um, and my patients, my athletes, and really what we call this um, lecture and I just got to tool it up right here, it is really the orthobiologics in the elite athlete and the lessons we learned for you that's going to help all of you, all of us as practitioners, things over the years that we've learned from these great athletes as part of my career working with our various teams, our athletes, and every sports doctor out there trying to figure out how optimally to work with these athletic problems. In many ways, each of the sports physicians have developed their algorithms, evidence-based algorithms, all of which have been tried and true and tested on courts and fields everywhere. And in fact, if things aren't working, and that's why I say the lessons we've learned to help all of you. And that's really what tonight is about. And uh, we're gonna talk about that going forward. Also, be able to put myself in a place where at practice, when I'm training and doing games, I switch my mind to something else, to switch my mode into something else, right? For me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt. It's go time. And that's how it starts for athletes. All of our athletes, Kobe Bryant is one great one, but you see Usain Bolt, and we know it's sports medicine. It's a trilogy. It's a trilogy of performance, prevention, and then care when we have problems in our athlete population. And for us as the practitioners managing each of these great athletes at whatever sport, at whatever level, it's about concepts, techniques, and technologies. And that's what I'm going to speak to tonight, is really the integration of concepts, the techniques and technologies, and how it blends into evidence-based practice when we're taking care of your patients going forward. Well, the story really started in 11, 2011, with Kobe Bryant having a problem. Everybody got excited. I wanted to have what Kobe had. It became so significant that each of us in, in managing every athlete came to us and it reminded me of this. I'll have what she's having. And everybody's saying, I'll have what she's having. And push this as physicians, as surgeons, all types of physicians to basically help our patients. Well, all of a sudden I was reminded of basically patients always have hope and then there's knowledge. And we have seen in this last 12 years, the gap between hope and knowledge. 
And unfortunately, in many places, just like it was in Ben Franklin's day, when in, in 1784, he in Paris, France, was in charge of verifying and validating snake oil. Does it work? He developed double-blind approaches. He learned about the placebo effect. And he was in charge of making sure the gap between hope and knowledge wasn't maximized. We want to minimize that gap over time as we learn these concepts, technique, and technologies in our athletic population. So let's think about sports in general. If we look at sport, we learn a concept that we call the burden. And the burden is the frequency of the injuries times lost days. And if you look at soccer, football, baseball, basketball, whatever it is, hamstrings are number one in terms of the numbers. Then it comes down to ACL tear. And what are at least a third of our athletes get that makes them retire is osteoarthritis. So we have to think about all these things going forward as physicians, as practitioners, to optimally manage these situations. So what are we gonna be thinking about? We're gonna think about hamstring strains, tendons, tendinopathy and repair of tendons. We're gonna look about ligaments, MCL, ACL, repair, reconstruction, meniscus repair, and then we'll get to the cartilage, the ultimate culprit and end organ to everything we talk about, talk about repair, protecting, and facilitating performance. And as I said, what tonight is about, it's about concepts, technique, and technology. So we want to develop a way to think about this. Again, the gap can be big between hope and knowledge, but we're going to help you understand when we recommend something. When with the yellow light, we have to go with caution. And when we have a red light, either it is not recommended or it's something that from outside, extrinsic forces, regulatory forces, such as the FDA, have recommended we not do that. So the red, the yellow, and the green will be our way of making that recommendation with respect to orthobiologics for all of these issues going forward. It's a good place to start in Rockville, Maryland. As you can see, the FDA in June of 20, 2021 changed our whole field. And they basically said that they regulate and unapproved products, stem cell products, fat-derived cell, umbilical cord, exosomes, amniotic fluid, wart jelly, were not recommended by the FDA. And the only ones that were approved were approval with an IND through FDA oversight, or if it were approved stem cells and bone marrow transplants for hemopoietic disorders. So again, it kind of narrowed us to autologous products. So what does the family look like? What is the menu that we have to choose from? Corticosteroids, glucosamine, HA, PRP, cytokine modulation, stem cell procedures. And again, we're talking about the autologous aspects. Allogeneic cells, can't use them. Induced propotential cells, we haven't discovered them yet. Exosomes, maybe. And we'll go right down this list all the way and figure out which ones we do recommend and which ones we don't. Now, a fellow by the name of Everett Rogers gave us this. It's great. It's good for all innovation. It's called the innovation diffusion curve. And it starts with the innovators down over here, 2.5% of the population, people that innovate. Then we have the early adopters right there, 13.5%. And at some point, we hit the tipping point over here and we get into the early majority. We're not there yet. We're over here at the early adopters, just trying to figure it out, trying to get to the tipping point, and then into the early and late majority. And then later on, we'll joke about it in the future, the laggards. <laughs> so innovation diffusion curve helps us understand this. When we really think about precision medicine today, when we look at orthobiologics, for the most part, we're talking about PRP, and we're going to use that as our reference point. Yes, we'll talk about fat. Yes, we'll talk about bone marrow and other orthobiologic components. But it's in reference to PRP because that's where the bulk of the 
information comes. And when we think about precision medicine, it's about personalized care, predictive, preventative, and participatory. We call that the P4 medicine, the four aspects of precision medicine going forward. So we start with hamstring strains. For my athletes on my team, as the team physician for this team, this is a hamstring strain in this athlete. And Josie runs off the field with this hamstring strain. Knowing that hamstring strains in baseball, soccer, MLB, $29 million per year. Major League Soccer, $7 million per year for the burden. So we better develop some good solutions. Here's one that's very interesting. In this study that was performed uh, in, in athletes with grade two hamstring strains, they aspirated the hematoma, injected PRP. People always ask, what was the PRP? In this case, it was a high platelet, high white count PRP, the GPS system there. And what they found, interestingly enough, was that return to play 32.4 days in the ones that did not get the PRP, 23.5 days in those that did, statistically different, the P less than 0.001. And in fact, uh, the conservative group had a recurrence of 28% versus 4% in the PRP and aspiration group. So the clear difference in terms of how we can manage. And I think this was a groundbreaking study uh, that really helps us understand some of the next steps of what to do. So there you have it. We give it a green light because we feel comfortable based on this study showing such statistical differences. How about the tendon? And the question then comes to what type of PRP that we could use? Well, certainly in the tendon, this has been well-researched now, that if we look at the difference between leukocyte-rich PRP and leukocyte-poor, they find that the leukocyte-rich PRP stimulates more TGF beta-1. And in addition, in the tendon, more platelet-derived growth factor. And you can see the difference between poor and rich. Now, we're only talking about the tendon here. So you can see that you get more, and they have a number 20 times more release of growth factors and with respect to tenocyte proliferation when they use the rich component. So again, the tendon, and again, what we're going to hear from me is it's everything is specific to what we're trying to accomplish. We cannot, there isn't one size that fits, fits all. And if you try that, that's when we get into problems. If you look at this study in a randomized control uh, trial, of patients who had the rotator cuffs repaired, what they find in fact was that when they used the PRP seven times greater and activated. So again, these two little details are really important. The PRP multiplication is high and there's also a 10% uh, calcium chloride activation. When they use that with medium to large rotator cuff repair, in comparison in this RCT, it improved the quality, decreased the retail rate, and increased the outcome from the supraspinatus. So this is really important details in terms of helping us understand what to do and how with a high degree of specificity, we could answer the questions about what we're using in that particular surgical situation. We'll talk more about this later and we give it a green light to go forward. As we move into the tendinopathy, when you look at uh, the patellar tendinopathy cases, you can see there are conser four conservative studies, two surgical studies. In fact, uh, after uh, bone patellar tendon, uh, you can see better pain control, better healing at six months. As a consequence of the conservative uh, treatment for uh, tendinopathy versus the surgical treatment, for this whole area of patellar tendon, we give a yellow light. Maybe we need more studies, but in fact, enough is here that we can move ahead uh, with caution, but continue to move forward going, going that direction with respect to tendinopathy and ACL surgery using BTV. In terms of ligament, uh, we could see this study that was done, published in the Arab Journal of Science and Research in 2021, where they selected 31 patients, retrospective study, 
with, with MCL injuries by ultrasound. And they found the PRP peer to be effective uh, and improve clinical outcome going forward. And in this situation, we in fact give a green light and acute MCL injuries, especially in our athletes, we go ahead and we will do this. Again, our major goal is to decrease the return to play and also the re-injury rate, much like we saw with the hamstring injury. We turn to ACL injuries. These are the populations we're talking about. Athletes are cutting and tearing your ACLs. Now, a lot of discussion about this, what we call the BEAR technique, Bridge Enhanced ACL Repair. And they published this study in 2020 saying it's not inferior. But you can see here the re-injury rate that was 14% for the BEAR group and 6% for the ACL reconstruction in this controlled trial. Again, that 14% with, with respect to my opinion is much too high. And um, although the statistics are different, it's really the fragility of this study, which renders it, if they've got one more retear in a bear group, it'll be statistically different. And you can see in this study, when we look at ACL repair, there's a 33% revision after ACL reconstruction. We're talking about athletes now, and as a consequence, we recommend a red light for that athletic population. In a more recent study uh, from New York by um, Greg DeFelice, he found that there was a 37% retail rate in ACL repairs in his series in, in individuals younger than 22 years of age. Um, we just shut off here. Excuse me. We'll be back. Um, so I think that it's important to recognize that we are more focusing on ACL reconstruction. And why? If you look at this study from Radici in, in Santiago, Chile, published 13 years ago, in a 50 patients with ACL reconstruction, 25 with PRP, 25 without, and they found a 48% reduction in healing time with the PRP. In other words, the graft matures in 48% less time when you put PRP. Now, for all of us as ACL surgeons, that's really an important thing. Now, that doesn't mean we're sending our athletes back into play yet, but for this component part of our ACL paradigm, we're helping our graphs moving forward and better. We need to figure this out, how it fits in the whole picture, but it certainly helps. And as a consequence, I give it a green light, and we call it biological enhancement of ACL graphs going forward. How about meniscus repair? Another very important part. When you look at in cells, regenerative effects of PRP in meniscus cells in vitro and in vivo, they find that PRP stimulates matrix synthesis great and greater mRNA expression of biglycan and decorin. In the vivo study, uh, it's significantly better for meniscus repair both uh, when they received uh, PRP going forward. Now, David Flanagan in his study showed that it was very interesting where they had 512 patients. Uh, and as you can see here, in the group receiving PRP with meniscus repair, in other words, the meniscus was repaired just like you see in this photograph, and then PRP was injected with calcium chloride to stimulate that. And what they found was that in this line, that it went up to 95% versus 75% down over here, T less than 0 0.008 different, just putting the PRP. But in the ACL reconstructed groups here, it had no statistical difference. But so in this situation, we can say that when you have no ACL tear, you've got this type of meniscus repair that you have a 25% difference in terms of survivability with a very statistical difference uh, that is significant. So what do we do there? Green light, and we do this on every meniscus repair. We wanna get a 25% greater survivability. So we're very positive about that. As we move into cartilage, 
uh, we find some great studies. And this study comes from Canada, Reedy Candela's lab, and um, very exciting. Where they took the cartilage repair technique that they used, uh, the tissue engineered cultured and 20% PRP, they found that there was superior compressive mechanical properties. And you look uh, here between bovine serum, platelet, four plasma, and PRP, a very statistically different in terms of having a higher GAD content and higher uh, equilibrium modulus of elasticity. So basically, by changing it up in terms of increasing the GAD content from the PRP, you improve the mechanical capabilities of the cartilage repair. So this is really important to us. We just have to figure out how to put this into our algorithm. So what have we learned from our athletes with respect to cartilage? Here's an example of one of our athletes, a 25-year-old playing professionally. But on x-ray, you can see right there, there's narrowing of the joint space. The elevator is going down. We look at the balance of osteoarthritis in our young athletes, and it's a balance between catabolism and anabolism. So what we want to do is we want to tip the tide, shift the balance towards anabolism, and reduce the progression of OA. How are we going to do that? Well, we got to think in terms of a lot of different multimodal approaches, one of which Mike Chicotti has talked about is the use of glucosamine. In this simple intervention, he concludes, may protect joint cartilage and delay osteoarthritis progression. We use this routinely in our athlete population as a consequence. Green light goes there. We look at high molecular weight HA, and that's an important distinction because they are not the same. They're very different, and we'll talk about why in a second. But we know that as we age, our cartilage requires more lubrication. And as we age, the molecular weight of our own HA that we produce, it reduces in kilodaltons going forward in terms of molecular weight. And we know that HA decreases the inflammatory response and improves the viscoelastic properties while it protects the cartilage degeneration going forward. A consequence here it is, we give a green light for HA going forward. Now, we've heard a tremendous amount about this organization not recommending it, CPGs, et cetera, and so forth. Well, came along this article just three years ago. And what they found, here it is, the details and the data, the differences between high molecular weight HA and low molecular are very, very significant in terms of the minimal of clinical important improvement. The MCII threshold is in this particular, the high molecular weight, when you reevaluate this in this network meta-analysis, you find it meets the threshold. So all the previous work with the CPEGs that were done previously dealt with all HAs, but when you split them out, and again, everything I talk about is in relation to specificity. Are there lots of platelets at sevenfold, or is it one and a half fold? Are there lights, lots of leukocytes? Is it high or low molecular weight? So we as clinicians have to have this degree of specificity because we won't see differences. And I love this study because it really points out if you just break out the, the two different types of HA, you see the very different, minimally clinically important improvements associated with them. And they're statistically different between here and here. And I think that's the elegance of this particular study going forward. So how does PRP work? We talked about PRP and we talk about it as a reference point. And there are lots of different approaches here. As you could, when you can read the studies, there's the list. Everything from Sunman to Sadowski, uh, all the way through between 2014 and 21. Uh, and everything, it says PRP treatment decreases catabolism uh, and matrix metalloproteinases. Uh, it, it affects lubricin. It affects the basically the progression of uh, hyperalgesia. It attenuates in oak one b All of these have a different mechanism of action. But I think that's what the interesting thing about this is that all PRP isn't the same. 
that patient A and patient B make different PRP, different components of proteins, different components of cells. We just need to figure it out and understand that. At the moment, we're getting more and more granular, being able to say, aha, if we use this much platelets, we can have this effect, and we use this much white cells, we can have that effect. But we need to get better and have more clarity. So how I think about it is this. This is uh, from Mao's work. You can see he's in the auger here, the PRP over here. Now look what happened. Look what happens to the, the MSCs. They're summoned to the PRP. And when they get there, what do they do? They proliferate. So we want a stem cell treatment to raise the stem cells to the party. It summons them. And then once there, they proliferate. And that's important, a very important feature here. And these effects of PRP, not only do they have all these growth factors, but they have a positive effect on cartilage metabolism and regeneration, the synovium, the meniscus, and chondrocytes. This is really important. I think it's important that people appreciate uh, the relationship between PRP and MSCs going forward. Now, as a consequence, we give a green light with respect to PRP. And again, we're constantly trying to tip the balance here. As I said, so many different mechanisms, but I like the one that the PRP stimulates cell proliferation of chondrocytes, potentiates SOX9 transcription, and elevates collagen 2A1 and ACAN expression. And this is shown in a no, in numerous studies going forward. In addition, as I mentioned, uh, you can see from Emily Sunman and Lisa Fortier's study uh, that when you have more white cells, you elevate the MMP9 and interleukin-1 beta that creates a catabolic situation unto itself. And when you lower the white cells, you see the opposite effect going forward. Again, a classic study helping us understand the specificity. How about PRP efficacy with respect to osteoarthritis evidence? And again, nowadays we have a multitude of randomized controlled trials. Uh, you can see them. We picked out in this in this particular article a number of the classic ones that are very helpful. But take a look at that. Read these papers. When people say there's no literature, here it is. It's a composite. And now we can get more and more granular going forward. Granular to the point, as we can see in this nature <coughs> article and scientific report, that they specifically talk about the correct dose that's critical for long-term efficacy. They say you need 10 billion platelets is crucial for PRP. So again, people say, I had PRP. Well, how many platelets did you have? I have no idea. Does your doctor know? No, I have no idea. So how can we say it has a long-term sustained chondroprotective effect when you see here that 10 billion platelets is really crucial for long-term effects. So where are we going in the future? How are we going to think about this going forward? What are the lessons we're learning? This is part of what we call the BARB study, which is the Biologic Association Registry and Biorepository, where we're taking patients PRP when we give them to with KL2 and KL3 OA. We're breaking them down to responders and non-responders based on the MIC. And we learn here, right there, you can see early study, the first 20 patients, it turns out if you have more platelets, you have a much greater chance of responding. Aha, so maybe the low platelet situation wasn't as good. Another conclusion that we make as we go forward, we gotta think in those terms. We can't just say all PRP, it's too heterogeneous. Well, more lessons to be learned because we're now changing again. Because just like everything else in medicine, it could be multimodal, but it could also develop an adjuvant combination. This is what I call PRP 3.0. HA and PRP are synergistic. Why? Because what HA induces the release of more TGF beta 1 and PDGF from the PRP, as you can see here. Amazing. So now we get into two-component adjuvant medicine. And Brian Cole and his group looked at this, and they conclude 
in their meta-analysis that when patients with NeoA were injected with PRP and HA had a much greater improvement than HA alone. And again, everything we're doing is in relation. The reference point for me in the orthobiologic family is PRP. So when we speak in those terms, we're now learning that when you add HA to PRP, it could be better than PRP alone, but this study just says that PRP and HA is better than HA alone. How about if we look at the differences between leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor? In this particular double-blind randomized controlled trial coming from the Rizzoli Institute by Stefano Zabagini, what they find it was that there were no differences, no differences improvement at 12 months. Now, this is the only study, but again, we have to look at this and balance it out. What questions we want to ask ourselves? The biggest question is ask, what was the platelet co concentration? Was it that 10 billion platelets that we saw from the, the Nature Scientific Report earlier? So as we get to be more sophisticated, we can then not only criticize the research, but we can develop better research projects for the future. So we give a yellow light. We say, yeah, it's good and interesting, but maybe we need to learn more here to figure this out. How about this? How about bone marrow aspirin? Everybody loves bone marrow aspirin. How good is it? Systematic review from University of Colorado. And what they conclude is the BMAC is effective in improving pain, but there's no clinical superiority to PRP or any other biological therapy. Now, why is that important? Well, if you look at, for me in my training room, not only is when you look at PRP versus BMAC, well, it's not only, uh, it, it's more of an invasive procedure, it also costs probably 10 times or seven times more than, than using PRP alone. So we have to reserve this, although, it's very effective, we have to use it at the right time because we have to make sure it's cost effective. And I am a fan of BMAC, but you have to know when to use it and it shouldn't be your first line of treatment in going through each of these situations. So we give it a yellow light going forward. If we ask ourselves uh, in this particular uh, bone mass aspirin, uh, is it equivalent to PRP? in this randomized prospective trial by Adam Ants. Um, and what he concludes, again, an OA RCT 24 months that BMAC was not superior to PRP. This doesn't mean that we don't think BMAR, BMAC is effective. It is effective, but it's not superior. So we have to put it in our algorithm in terms of cost efficacy going forward. And I think that's very important that we interpret it in those terms. Again a yellow light, and to use it appropriately in our algorithm. Now, it gets even more complicated. We bring in fat, and there's a myriad of studies done with adipose micro, microfragmented fat and, and SVF. Alberto Gobi, one of the best researchers in the world from Milan, Italy, did a study where he compared AMAT to HA and PRP. And once again, he found that there was no significant differences between these two interventions. Again, it means that they're both effective, but there's no superiority of one versus the other. So just like BMAC, my point here is that we use PRP in the algorithm, and we have to think about this in terms of cost efficacy going forward, and both of which have a role but again, we have to put that all into perspective. As a consequence, we put in a green light uh, for both, but again, putting uh, the AMAT in a position, the algorithm, where you're being more selective going forward. How about, and I know we have a lot of people on this webinar coming from around the world. Uh, we're looking at the role of doing expanded mesenchymal stem cells uh, associated with the OA, this report coming from Korea. And you can see here that there is a significant improvement uh, with respect to these patients given expanded MSCs. 
uh, in and of themselves. It's not a comparison, but is a systematic review meta-analysis showing that compared to the control, it shows it favors the, the expanded MSCs. I think we need to have more reports of comparing expanded versus non-expanded MSCs going forward. As a consequence, uh, we don't have this available to us in the United States, uh, I, but I say for those internationally, we would proceed with a yellow light going forward. Now, here's another great study that comes uh, published in, in uh, 2020 uh, from my good friend from Porto, Portugal, uh, João uh, Espargueira Mendes. And what they did was a great study. This is a controlled double-blind clinical trial where they used expanded uh, bone marrow-derived cells. And they found a group when they took MSCs plus PRP, you can see those are the green bars. Those are the best situations overall in using the various Ku scales. So the conclusion here is that bone marrow-derived MSCs plus PRP seems to be the best. And this is a uh, cortisone comparative study going forward. Again, the cortisone in the blue, um, and you can see the green when you mix the MSCs and PRP. So again, this adjuvant treatment seems to be extremely excited. And I'm very excited to see how this pans out. And again, we get a yellow light from a global perspective. We do not have that available to us here in the United States. So how do we finish up overall? Let's talk, put, talk about this and put this in perspective. We talk about precision medicine. What do we learn? Muscle strains. And again, you're going to hear about specificity, specificity, specificity. And if you're going to take a photograph, take a photograph of this slide, because this is a great compilation of a lot of different studies that we talked about. For a muscle strain, you want to have moderate to high platelets, moderate to high white cells. You want to activate those with calcium chloride, and you're going to dose them one time. From tendon rotator cuff repair and tendinopathy, same thing. We learned about leukocyte rich. You want to have Lots of leukocytes, lots of platelets. You want to activate it. And in a situation of tendinopathy, you can use one to three times. In a rotator cuff, it's only one time. How about ligament healing and ACL reconstruction? Platelets, high, as you can see, up in this four to eight number. Leukocytes, moderate high. Calcium chloride, activation. And you only get one time over here. Same is true for meniscus repair. Moderate high, moderate high, calcium chloride, and one time. Cartilage repair, low, moderate, or high. We don't really know the exact number, but we learn with respect to OA that we've got to be at that 10 billion number that we talked about. In terms of the white cells, it's low and moderate in this situation, especially in OA, because the MMP9, the interleukin, one, rise. And activation, we learn, also could help. When it comes to cartilage repair, it's one injection. But when it talks to OA, you could inject one to three times. We don't have all the answers and differences yet. Plus or minus high molecular weight only in change. So this really is a compilation of how we're going to use our first-line algorithm that we've learned in our athletic population. Before I finish, I really want to talk about one a very exciting area that's exciting for me because I take care of a lot of female athletes and estrogens are really important. What we have learned is that cartilage has many estrogen receptors. We have estrogen alpha, alpha um, beta, there are uh, isomers of this, uh, 36, 46, 66, or androgenic receptors, progesterone receptors, and what happens is cartilage is very sensitive, very sensitive to estrogen levels. And in this particular study done in Melbourne, Australia, they followed women for 10 years. And they found that if they looked at uh, relationships of estradiol level to the incidence of total knee replacement, it was a hazard ratio of 0.7. In other words, if you had less estradiol, you had a 0.7 greater probability of having a total knee replacement. 
The same was true for interstenediol and inversely proportional to sex hormone binding globulin. And that just means that the more of that you have, the less working hormone you have. So what do we conclude? That circulating sex hormones have a direct effect on OA pathogenesis, something we've got to pay attention to going forward. So as I'm telling you, concepts, technique, technology, all of a sudden come through this report from China, looking at the mechanisms of estradiol. And what they find is that estrogen turns on the estrogen receptor and it follows this newly discovered pathway. The Chatuin pathway, turning on the messenger RNA, AMPK, mTOR, right down and creates a viability and proliferation of chondrocytes. The point of the matter is, we're learning the relationships between simple things like estrogen, estrogen receptors, and chondrocyte viability and improving the ability for the cartilage cell to maintain the matrix and survive going forward. Consequence, we must think about this in our athletes and other patients. So how do we conclude here tonight? Well, again, we talked about Ben Franklin. We've talked about our athletes, the trilogy. We've learned about concepts, techniques, and technology. Well, there you have it. When it comes to cortisone, we'll always give cortisone a yellow light because we know that the good, the bad, the different. Glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, HA, PRP, we give a green light. We don't know enough about interleukin-1 inhibition yet. It doesn't appear to be as good as PRP, and we need more study, but we give it a yellow light. In terms of the green light of adipose and BMAC, we do. But we must think in terms of cost efficacy going forward because it is invasive and it costs a lot more. Allogeneic stem cells, at least in the United States, are not legal by the FDA. And induced pluripotential stem cells, exciting. That is our, our holy grail. We need to do better. We need to develop those going forward. And the same may be true for exosomes. We need to learn more about that. We're going to be doing studies coming forward. In terms of alpha-2 macroglobulin, we're going to study that. Amniotic fluid, again, FDA has ruled against it. The estrogens, green light, we need to think about that. And we need more studies with respect to M2 macrophages and WNT pathway inhibitors. Again, we've learned a lot in terms of how we treat our approaches and when we use orthobiologics. The only thing we really conclusively find that ACL repair for athletes is just not, doesn't meet the muster. Greater than 30% the athletic population, it's something we don't recommend at this point in time. As we talked about, everything is about the innovation diffusion curve. And as we march forward from being innovators, early adopters like all of us on this call tonight, soon, we're going to pass the tipping point and get better at this going forward. Well, I hope you've learned some of the lessons that I have learned from our athletes, because that's what it's about. How do we take those lessons from our elite athletes and how do we help you? So thank you very much. Have a good night. And we're here for some questions and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandenbaum. Um, if you guys do have any questions, go ahead and type those in so we can take advantage of the time that he is here. And getting started, uh, we had a question, is PRP only effective in tears of the medial meniscus in the vascular region? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, one of the studies we did and Jorge Shala uh, published uh, on this in arthroscopy. And what we found was there are clonogenic cells in the white, white area, actually are more concentrated than in the red, red area. So there are progenitor cells waiting to be turned on right there. And we think that's a great opportunity. We're now doing a study in mini pigs, looking at everything from PRP to MSCs on how we could stimulate those clonogenic cells and to what degree. So the answer is probably all areas can repair. And we shouldn't, like we thought in the past, turn away from white, white tears just because they're white 
because in fact, there are progenitor cells there and it may be a great opportunity for us to repair menisci when we, in the past, we thought we could not. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, have we seen any evidence that PRP can halt the progression of osteoarthritis? Well, you know, part of when you look at that, all those studies on the mechanism of action and turning on uh, SOX9, ACAIN, uh, COL2, all these target expressive genes and transcriptions that are going on, um, have we created a disease modifier. Well, to get the label disease modifier is really difficult, um, very, very difficult. But if I were sitting across in a webinar in 2033, I would take the bet that we are disease modifying because we can manipulate these systems for the first time. It's like there's a genie out of the box and now we can do these things. It'll take us years. And again, taking an evidence-based approach to this, it's going to take us years to prove that. But it is my hypothesis that it will become as we get better and we learn, just like we learned, it takes 10 billion platelets to become chondroprotective. Maybe we're dancing around at four or five and it's not chondroprotective at that level. So as our specificity goes up, as we use our methods of assessment of platelets and concentration of platelets and white cells, uh, and as we, we're now in, in the next level of understanding. So yes, I think it will be, but at this point, point we can't say reliably it is. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you see as, or do you see that there is one in general, an age for youth um, the using PRP in the youth population? Is there a cutoff? There's no cutoff at this point. Uh, we know that in, in as we age, the number of of progenitor and stem cells in our bodies decrease from from being a newborn. Uh, we know that if you take a um, serum from a young mouse and we put serum in, in an old mouse, the the mouse exhibits a lot of young my, my mouse features. Um, so this relationship between age and regenerative potential is something. I find really fascinating. And again, it's another untold story. We're gonna learn more over time, but until then, uh, I think that we'll see studies in, in patients. Uh, it'll be difficult to prove because we have 23 year old knees that are older than the 65 year old who doesn't have any arthritis. So it's not really an age thing, um, but it can be an aging thing, especially post-traumatically. So we have to also, develop, you know, in, in certain areas, people are developing DNA age, or we, we need to develop some method of saying at what age that knee is with that early osteoarthritis. Okay, great. Uh, where would you use leukocyte poor PRP? We like to use leukocyte poor PRP in those situations. The word poor, um, you know, it's a binary word, poor or rich, but the reality is it's a non-binary situation. Uh, there are some individuals who believe that some but lower white cells, moderate white cells is better because there's a action, a reaction and another action uh, biologically. And um, so I think my view of this is, I think probably a lower amount is a good thing so you don't turn on the MMP9 and the interleukin-1. Uh, but I, I do think that we have to be open to the concept of, of the moderate aspects, especially when you, when you see the paper coming from the Rizzoli Institute showing that, again, it, it's a binary poor rich comparison, uh, but they show no difference. So there's something here, but it's going to be more quantifiable as we learn more. Okay, the next question has two parts to it. Are you using intraosseous PRP for your OA cases? Is this not a place where BMAC intraosseous with PRP intraarticular and adjacent structures such as meniscus tendons? That's a great question. 
you know, one of my, I'm a fan of Philippe Pernaglou's work. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, he did a randomized control trial back in 2002, where he had a group of patients with OA. He had um, half of them he injected intraarticularly, the other half he injected intraosseously. And he found that the rate of knee replacement um, in the group that he injected into the bone was one quarter that of those that were injected with BMAC into the joint. So the concept is if you fix the bone, then you reduce the ongoing progression of OA. I think that's a very interesting concept. Um, and I think we have to have a bigger experience of using interosseous. I don't think we're using it enough to truly have another reliable opinion. So I think it's a great concept. I think we need to learn more about it. I think we need to use that and approach that with a yellow light because I think that's something that could have a lot of fruitful opportunities for us. Okay, I think we have one more question here. So have you seen any promising relationship between using protein concentrate from platelet poor plasma for sports medicine applications? Hello, so I'm here, the screen switched. Okay. Do you need Go me to ahead. repeat the question for you? Yes, please. It, it okay. Wouldn't. Yeah. Have you uh, seen any promising relationship between using protein concentration from the platelet poor plasma for sports medicine applications and treating osteoarthritis? Yeah, I think the, the whole issue of looking at the uh, proteins uh, from the platelet poor plasma is a fascinating one. The alpha-2 macroglobulin concentration and other proteins that we're going to learn more about. I know there a great study from NYU came out that really showed that it was comparable to PRP and cortisone in terms of pain relief. We need to do more studies. I'm really excited about this area, especially as using um, some of these proteins to facilitate adjunctively with, and we're now beginning to use HA, PRP, and uh, the A2M or these proteins in concert, trying to look at maximal effect, especially in those difficult patients. So I think it's an unanswered question. I think it's a great, there's some great opportunities for us here, and we need to advance our evidence-based interpretation of that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for your participation in Dr. Mandelbaum's webinar tonight. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Mandelbaum, for sharing your expertise on one of your greatest passions, which is obviously orthobiologics in the elite athlete. Um, we do have an upcoming webinar with Dr. Ashu Royal. That'll be Thursday, June 1st at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. So you can register for that event the same way that you did for Dr. Man uh, Mandelbaum's lecture today. So thanks again for joining us, everyone. Thanks again, Dr. Mandelbaum, and everybody have a fantastic evening. Have a good night. Thank you.